Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for intermediate algebra. In this video, we're going to look at section 8.3, which is exponential functions. Now, in a lot of the sciences, we come across uh, places where we use exponential functions. Some of them might be in physics, like if we're measuring heating or cooling, or in that case, even meteorology. We see a lot of uh, exponential functions when it comes to chemistry, and ex uh, we have radioactive decay. Or maybe in biology, where we have the growth of a bacteria, that would be exponential. We also see it in business when we deal with things like interest. Maybe we're compounding interest. We'll see exponential functions. So it has many applications in many different fields. So let's take a look at what an exponential function is. Our general ex exponential function is f of x equals a base raised to a power. And hopefully, we're comfortable with our rules of exponents because, of course, we're working with exponential functions. So all those rules are going to apply. So we have a base raised to a power. And what we have to do is define this base. In order to be a function, the base has to be greater than 0. We can't have a negative base because that wouldn't be a one-to-one -one function. And b, the base, cannot equal 1 because 1 to any power never changes. The definition of an exponential function is something that grows or decays at a constant factor, while 1 as a, as a base would never change. It wouldn't grow, nor would it decay. So these are the restrictions to the base. So let's uh, look at something that we're familiar with. Here we have f of x equals x squared. This is not an exponential function. This is what's called a power function because we have a base that's changing, and the power is constant. So it's not changing by a constant factor. The factor is what is changing. It's not constant. An exponential function would be something like this. We have a factor of 2, which is our base, being raised to the variable. To be an exponential function, our variable or our input value has to be in the exponent. It has to be the power that is changing. So let's take a look at this function, f of x equals 2 to the x. And let's actually graph this function. Well, we're going to graph it initially by using a table of values. So we're just going to put in some values of x. And hopefully, we're comfortable with those exponents. And we're going to find out what the output or the y f of x value is. So if my input is negative 3, 2 to the negative third, and I'm going to write that right here, 2 to the negative third. Well, hopefully, we recall that a negative exponent means take its reciprocal, which would be 1 over 2 to the third. And now we can do 2 to the third, which is 1 eighth. So we can write in here 1 eighth. When x is negative 3 for this exponential function, f of x is 1 eighth. Let's put in negative 2. Well, if we put in negative 2, I'm going to take its reciprocal right away to save a step. We'd have 1 over 2 squared, which is 4, 1 fourth. If I have negative 1, that's the reciprocal of 2. 2 to the negative first is 1 half, its reciprocal. If we have 0, 2 to the 0 power, well, anything to the 0 power is 1. And I'm going to star this value because we're going to explore that more in-depthly when we move on in this section. 1, if I put 1 in here, 2 to the first power is just 2. 2 to the second power is 4. 2 to the third power is 8. And if we recall, if we look at the, when we had negative 3 as our input, we got 1 eighth. And positive 3 as our input, we got 8. Well, we can see that these values are reciprocal because the powers indicated reciprocal, right? Negative 3 or positive 3 in the exponent. So now that we have these, this table of values, we can actually go ahead and graph it. This is my ordered pair xy. When x is negative 3, we had 1 eighth. So let's go ahead and graph that. I'm coming over to the left 3, and I'm going to graph 1 eighth. So that's my first ordered pair. When x was negative 2, I got 1 quarter. So I'm going to put that right there. When x was negative 1, I got 1 half. When x was 0, I got 1. 
And hopefully we recall when x is 0, we're actually at the y-axis. That's, that's the y-intercept. Uh, when x is 1, we got 2. When x was 2, we got 4. And when x was 3, we got 8. That's going to put us right at the edge of our graph. Now we can kind of see the behavior, the pattern of this function. And we can go ahead and graph it. As I get closer to the y-axis, it's increasing. And then when I get past the y-axis, it really starts to increase. It's increasing every single time by a factor of 2. 2 to the first, 2 squared, 2 to the third. It's increasing by a factor of 2 each time. So we can see that this is an exponential function. It grows exponentially. It increases from left to right. So let's look at the behavior of some of these graphs. And we'll point out a few uh, things that I want to draw your attention to. Here I have the graph of three different exponential growth functions. I have in yellow, f of x equals 2x, what we just graphed. g of x in orange is 3 to the x, a larger base. h of x in red is 4 as our base to the x power. And we can kind of see their behavior. They look similar in their graphs and in their shapes. They're all increasing as we go left to right. But notice the larger the base, the faster it increases when we have a positive x value, something to the right of the y axis. So let's de determine some of the uh, properties of, this, uh, of these three graphs. Since they all behave similarly, they're going to have similar uh, behaviors when it comes to domain, range, intercepts. So it's domain. Well, if we think about it, what values of x can I plug in? Well, if we look at the graph, we can plug in any negative value. It's just going to give me that reciprocal. And it's going to get smaller and smaller because I'm dividing by that factor to a higher power in the denominator. As I go to the right, I positive values of x, it's going to get larger and larger in the y direction. So it's domain. I can put in any value of x. So its domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. That is its domain. There are no restrictions to this function. Its range, however, if I draw your attention to the x-axis, if we look at this graph, it never drops below the x-axis. So its lowest point would be 0. And if we think about it, if we have a base in, let's say, 2, and I raise it to a really high power, let's say, well, actually, let's say 2 to the negative 20th. Well, 2 to the negative 20th would be 1 over 2 to the 20th, which is a huge number. We're talking trillions upon trillions here. This is a huge number. Well, if I divide 1 by this huge number, it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's going to approach 0. But is there ever a value that will make this equal to 0? If I had 2 to the negative infinite power, it would never be 0. It would be infinitely close to 0. So when we look at the range, these values, no matter what the base is, as long as it's positive here, it's getting closer and closer to 0. But it will never be 0. So we cannot include 0 as our lowest value of y. But we see as that as we put in larger values of x or more positive values of x, it goes up, 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 and it is positive. So it goes to positive infinity. That is the range of, this, of any of these three graphs. If we look at its y-intercept, one thing we notice is they have the same y-intercept. And maybe we ask ourselves, well, why do they all have the same intercept? Well, that reason is because of the rules of exponents. Anything to the 0 power is 1. If we know our rules of exponents, it helps us understand the behavior of that graph. So the y-intercept for all three of these examples, when x is 0, y will be 1. So we have the ordered pair 0, 1 is our y-intercept. But since we talked about the range already, and we know it only gets close to 0 but never is 0, that means it never drops below the x-axis. So it doesn't cross the x-axis, meaning there are no x-intercepts. For these three examples, there are none. Now, let's look at 
these ones here. Now, what I want to point out is notice our bases were greater than 1. So this is any exponential function where the base is greater than 1. They're all going to have exponential growth. They're getting bigger from left to right. When we look at this graph, this is f of x equals b to the x. It is exponential. But b is between 0 and 1. That means maybe b is a fraction, like a half or a third or a fourth or a fifth, or maybe some decimal equivalent less than 1. And the three examples I have here is a base of 1 half, a base of 1 third, and a base of 1 fourth raised to some x value. Well, if we think about this, if we raise this power larger and larger in the positive direction, we're basically multiplying this factor by itself. 1 half times 1 half is a quarter. It's gotten smaller. A quarter times 1 half is an eighth. It's getting smaller yet. So this is an exponential decay because our base is less than 1. And of course, our base can't be negative. So if we look at this, the only behavior that's different between these is that it's decreasing. If we look at its domain, well, I can still put in any value of x. Because that fraction, whether I'm putting in a positive value of x, it's just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But it'll never cross the x-axis, meaning it has this same behavior. Its range is from 0 to infinity. As x gets negative, however, it goes to infinity. Its y-intercept still doesn't change because of that rule of exponents. Anything to the 0 power is 1. And because it doesn't drop below the x-axis, there are no x-intercepts. So one thing we should point out is what I like to call the reference point. Because of that rule of exponents that anything to the 0 power is 1, we can use that as a reference point. Now, this is a, an additional thing that I put in the video. Uh, and it's to help you recall something that we did in chapter 7. Now, in chapter 7, we looked at parabolas that were in this form. And hopefully, we remember the library function of a parabola. It had a vertex at the origin. If we think of that origin as our reference point of a parabola, well, if we had an h value, that moved the vertex either left or right. The k value moved that vertex up or down, and it would move our parabola somewhere on the graph. This is also a concept that is covered in section 9.1. Also, if we apply that same concept to exponential functions, the a tells me whether it's above the x-axis or below. The b is our base, just like we've looked at so far. Our variable is in the exponent, but now I've added this little piece to it, minus h. This basically just moves it left or right, just as it did uh, the vertex in a parabola. k moves the graph up or down, just like it did in a parabola. So if you can think of your exponential uh, functions in the same terms that we use for parabolas, you'll be able to graph these a little bit faster and not have to plot so many points. So when we talk about that reference points, instead of being the vertex like it was in a parabola, it is this point, 0, 1. Everything to the 0 or anything to the 0 power is 1, with the exception of 0, of course, which we can't have as our base. So hopefully this makes sense to you. If not, don't worry about it. It's something that we do cover in chapter 9. So <clears throat> we're gonna, I'll show you one example of it. But I'll show you the alternative method, which we've already seen. Let's, uh, let's move on to this example here. It says, let's graph f of x equals 3 to the x minus 1 power. Now, if I want to graph this, I know anything to the 0 power is 1. Well, what would make this power 0? Well, if I think about it in those terms, it would be positive 1, the opposite of what I see in here. x minus 1, I would need its opposite to be 0. So when x is 1, this power is 0. 3 to the 0 power is 1. So when x is 1, I get this point here, 1. I get 1, 1. Now, that is essentially the reference point. What happened is 
the function, if it was just 3 to the x, would pass through 0, 1. But because h is a positive 1, I move it to the right one spot. There is no k value out here to add or subtract, so I don't have to move it up or down. That is my reference point. Since I know my base is greater than 1, I know its behavior. It's going to increase left to right. So I'm going to graph this from left to right. And we see that's the graph. And notice, using that translation of h, I only needed one point in order to sketch the graph of this function. Now, let's say I'm not comfortable with using that translation. Let's actually plot some points. So if I make a table of values x and f of x, let's do some values of x. If x is 0, if x is negative 1, positive 1, and let's use 2 so we have enough points to see the behavior. Well, if x is 0, let's plug that in. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. 3 to the negative first is 1 third. So if I go to 0, I'd be at 1 third. And that's approximately where I drew that line. If x is negative 1, well, negative 1 minus 1 would be negative 2. 3 to the negative second is 1 over 3 squared, which is 1 ninth, which is getting closer to the 0 there. And the, my line does decrease, or my curve does decrease there. So we got 1 ninth. What if it's positive 1? Well, 1 minus 1 is 0. 3 to the 0 is 1. That was that reference point just shifted over one spot. So if we try 2, well, 2 minus 1 is 1. 3 to the first power is going to be 3. So that would be this value right here. So maybe I may have missed the mark when I drew it. But I essentially know its behavior. Now, let's determine the domain range y intercept and x intercept. The domain is all real values. I can put in any value of x. There's no domain restrictions. So its domain is negative infinity to infinity. Its range, well, we can see that it's approaching 0, but it'll never drop below that x-axis, so it does not include 0. But as, we, as x gets larger, it goes to infinity. And then the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept has changed. So this is where we have to find that value. It's not 0, 1 anymore because the graph was translated or shifted to the right. So we have to find that point. Well, to find a y-intercept, we set x equal to 0 and plug it in. Well, we've already done that. And we got 1 third. So we have this intercept. And I'll draw an arrow to it, 0, 1 third. That is our y-intercept. x-intercept, well, if it never drops below the x-axis, and that's what our range tells us, there are none. There are no x-intercepts here. So we were able to answer all these questions of this function. We know its behavior and what it's doing. And we were able to plot some points. So let's look at another example. This example I'm actually going to leave for you to try. Now, the first thing I want you to do is to graph it. You can graph it using translations. This one would be shifted to the left one from that reference point of 0, 1, and down one. So you bring all your points down one. If you're not comfortable doing that, just plug in points for x, find values for y, and plot them on the graph. Domain, determine the domain of this. Determine its range. Its range is now different because of this. So make sure you have those points and you can see what value it's actually approaching. The y-intercept, of course, that's going to change. Set x to 0, solve for that. This example has an x-intercept. And when you graph it, you'll be able to see that point and identify it. Or you could set this equal to 0. But we have yet to cover solving exponential equations. But you'll be able to determine it from the graph. So try this one on your own. And good luck. Keep practicing. This is section 8.3, Exponential Functions. Thank you for watching.